Hello and welcome to Neuroanatomy. I'm Tanya Chamberlain from the Division of Anatomy here at the University of Leeds and in this video I will be introducing the concept of neuroanatomy and the foundations that we will build on in the coming weeks. So what is neuroanatomy? Well in short, neuroanatomy is the study of the structure and organisation of the nervous system where we focus on the brain and the rest of the nerves. So the brain and the rest of the nerves. What we will be looking at is how these are structured. Like the rest of the body, they are made up of cells, but it is more evident in the nervous system because a lot of the time we can pull these cells apart to reveal their formation, to understand where these very large cells act. These common tracts of cells are termed neural circuits. And these neural circuits are the connections of individual cells that act as a highway system to ensure that the message is received and processed in the correct place. We will also need to look at some of the cells of the nervous system to understand how this works. But we are not particularly interested in looking at the physiology of these cells as this is beyond the scope of anatomy. But we will be looking at the fundamental rules that take place because of the specific properties of the cells in question. We will also need to address the blood supply to the nervous system so that we can identify the consequences of vascular compromise. And finally, we will be looking at the cranial nerves more closely. But why do we need to know about the nervous system? What does the nervous system do? Well, the nervous system is responsible for every function we have as human beings. It is responsible for our moods, the perception of pain, so it's responsible for keeping us safe. It is also responsible for monitoring our internal bodily functions, such as blood pressure, blood glucose levels, temperature. And it is responsible for monitoring our external environment. What the nervous system does is receive signals, process those signals and transmit the instruction on how to act. This might be to cry, smile or laugh, take painkillers, release hormones to return homeostasis, or to wrap up warm on a cold day. As we have seen, the nervous system is fundamental to mammalian life. And that means the study of the nervous system is relevant in a multitude of fields. Therefore, understanding the structure and the function of the nervous system forms the very basis of knowledge that we need so we find that neuroanatomy is at the root of all things nervous system related. Neuroanatomy spans disciplines such as neuroscience, psychiatry, psychology, medicine and dentistry. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. That is a whole book in itself. So let's have a look at the learning objectives for this video. After watching this and after any further self-directed study, you should be able to define the common terms used in neuroanatomy. Outline the development of the brain. Describe the internal anatomy of the spinal cord. List the spinal nerves and distinguish between dorsal and ventral spinal nerve roots and their component fibres. You should also be able to define the dorsal root ganglia. And first thing that we are going to look at is neuroatomical terminology. So the nervous system is a huge umbrella term that we use to describe all of the brain, spinal cord and every single of the 100 billion cells responsible for transmitting this information. Unfortunately, it is not specific enough for most fields, so we need to subcategorise elements of the nervous system. First we have the central nervous system that is composed of the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system which is every other nerve in the body. The PNS or peripheral nervous system can be further subdivided into somatic and autonomic nervous systems. In the crudest of terms the somatic nervous system is the stuff we have conscious control of or influence over such as skin muscles, whilst the autonomic nervous system is the stuff we don't have control over, 
like the secretion of glands, the actions of the digestive tract, or the vasoconstriction or dilation of the blood vessels. And to further divide the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system can either be sympathetic or parasympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system sympathises with the environment. So if we are startled, our sympathetic nervous system is responsible for our fight or flight response. It will increase our heart rate, void our bladder or bowels, promote increased circulation to our limbs for fighting or fleeing, Acting in opposition, the parasympathetic nervous system aims to bring our body back to baseline. So it restores heart rate to baseline, it returns circulation to our digestive tract, and it brings our breathing back under control. It is important to recognise that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems do not switch on and off, even in full flight mode. Our parasympathetic heartbeat regulation acts to prevent the heart beating faster and faster until it dies. My point is, even though we talk about a sympathetic and parasympathetic operating at different times, we are really talking about one of those systems having a greater effect than the other. Not that one turns off in favour of the other. The nervous system is primarily made up of a group of cells called neurons. There are many more types of cells in the nervous system, but for now we are only concentrating on the cells that transmit electrochemical messages to, from and within the central nervous system. So let's have a look at the neurons of interest. The first thing that we should talk about is that these cells are termed polarised cells, or cells with cellular polarity. That means their structure and physiological properties are different at different regions of the cell. This is important in neurons because that means the signal of electrochemical impulse can only travel in one direction. There are three types of neurons that we need to know about. The first is a sensory neuron, which are also called afferent neurons because they trigger a change in the nervous system. They act on the nervous system by transmitting signals to the CNS. The second neuron is the motor neuron, also known as the efferent neuron, because they result in a change after stimulation within the CNS. And lastly, we have these. These are the interneurons and located within the CNS and act to transmit an afferent signal from the sensory neurons to the efferent neurons in order to precipitate a change. And here we have them all together. So let's see how they work. Imagine you get your hand a little too close to a fire. Sensory receptors in your hand detect that your hand is hot and electrochemical signals are triggered. The signal travels the length of the afferent neuron or sensory neuron to the interneuron within the CNS. That carries the signal to the efferent motor neuron which travels back to the arm and tells the muscles of the arm to click, contracting and pulling your fingers away from the flame. So how are these signals transmitted? Well, we have two very simplified and generic neurons that are displaying cellular polarity. That means they are different from one end than the other. Let's add some labels to this diagram. First up are the dendrites. These might be receptors, depending on the cell. Then we have the cell body that contains the nucleus. We have this myelinated axon. These give the neurons a white appearance and this myelination is responsible for speeding up the transmission of the signal. Then finally, we have the synaptic terminals at the end of the cell. The signal travels from the dendritic area towards the synaptic terminals. But why are they called synaptic terminals? 
Well, that's because the first neuron joins the second neuron via a synapse. This synapse is a tiny space where the synaptic terminals come in very close proximity to the second neuron. So let's zoom in on this region. So here we can see that the impulse on this image is travelling from the left hand side of the screen to the right hand side of the screen. When it reaches the synaptic terminal, it signals to the proteins in the cell membrane to release chemicals called neurotransmitters into the synapse. These neurotransmitters, for which there are a lot of different types, bind to the receiving membrane proteins and trigger a change in properties of the cell that trigger a cascade of ion movements. These generate electrochemical signals that then transfer down the cell and across the axon. Now instead of calling these left cells and right cells as per the diagram, we have more specific names for these cells. The cell before the synapse is called the presynaptic cell and the cell after the synapse is called the postsynaptic cell. This will be important to remember because when we look when things go wrong, we can have different symptoms depending on whether it is a presynaptic cell at fault or a postsynaptic cell. So that's all we really need to do for introducing you to the neuron. So let's have a look at some other neuroanatomical terminologies. Now I'm sure that you've seen this image before when looking at anatomical direction terms. But I want you to largely disregard this image now because we have different terminology when looking at neuroanatomy. When we look at the head itself, we have four directions. We have the anterior or ventral aspect, the posterior or dorsal aspect. We have the superior, which describes the top of the head and the inferior, which describes the bottom of the head. However, when it comes to the nervous system, we have to look at it differently the reasons of which will become apparent soon. We think of the nervous system running along two planes. We have the spinal cord, which runs along a vertical plane. And we have the brain, which runs from the front of the skull to the back of the skull. When describing the perceived front of the brain, we call this rostral because it is near the nose or beak, which is where the term rostral comes from. I like to think of rooster. We describe the spine as being caudal, which kind of makes sense as it travels to the bottom of the back where we would have a tail. However, we also call the perceived back of the brain caudal too. Bear with me and I'll explain why in a minute. The back of the spine and the top of the brain are termed dorsal and the front of the spine and the underside of the brain are termed ventral. Okay, the reason why. So humans are obviously highly evolved and during that evolution we became bipedal. We learned to walk upright on two legs. But when we look at other mammals, we are looking at largely quadrupeds four-legged walking. Quadruped mammals have similar anatomy to us, but the orientation of their anatomy is different because they walk on all fours. If we look at this mouse, we can see that the brain and spinal cord are aligned. And I'll draw this on for you. So if we now look how we evolved, as we became more upright, our head and necks flexed forwards, or else we would be looking at the sky all the time. So the axis of our brains changed, which is why we call the back of our brains caudal, because historically it lined up on the same axis as the spine. Because we often use comparative anatomy of the nervous system, the brain in particular to our closest relatives, we use the same terminology to avoid cross-species confusion. That was a lot, so let's move on and look at the development of the brain.
This is a very beautiful adult cadaveric brain. On the left, we have the whole brain, for which here is the front or the rostral area. The right image shows the inside of the brain from a lateral perspective. So we have a mid-sagittal cut of the brain. And we are looking at the very middle of the brain, again with the rostral or nose end here. The area of the brain we most commonly think of is this area, termed the cerebrum. This could also be called the forebrain. The forebrain is our most developed brain and it is responsible for the higher order skills we have developed such as language, impulse control, personality, social construct, visual acuity, hearing, all of the functions you would expect to see in a highly evolved animal. The cerebrum consists of two parts. The first is the most identifiable part and if you brought a young child to look at this picture most of them would identify the squiggles and jiggles of the telencephalon or the cerebral hemispheres. Inside the cerebral hemispheres we have the diencephalon which literally translates to through brain. That's because the components of the diencephalon act as a bridge from the brainstem and the cerebral hemispheres. So messages that enter the brain from the spinal cord are processed and distributed to their relevant areas in the brain. We also have the brainstem, which is made up of three parts. The midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, or medulla for short. The brainstem is where you'll find 10 of the 12 cranial nerves and where the most basic functions of life are found. This region of the brain is the most ancient. It houses our respiratory centres, our heart rate centres, and the nuclei associated with digestion. Essentially, everything we need to be able to survive is located in this region of the brain. The cerebellum, or little brain, looks like a tiny brain that has been added on to what we associate the brain to be. This area is responsible for modulating coordination, so balance and movement and motor control. But in more recent years, we understand that the cerebellum has numerous other functions, including forming circuits for memory and learning and language. In short, it links in with most regions of the brain and modulates its actions. For the purposes of this module, you do not need to fully understand the roles of the cerebellum but appreciate that we will be coming back to it at various points throughout. And lastly, we have the spinal cord. This continues from the caudal aspect of the medulla and travels out of the cranium within the spinal canal. When the oocyte from the ovary is fertilised by a sperm, the combined cell undergoes a series of cellular divisions until an embryo is formed. Early stage embryos are filled with unspecialised cells that communicate with each other and gradually become more and more specialised as the days and weeks progress. Some of these cells will go on to form a primitive gut tube that travels from the mouth to the anus, whilst some cells will go on to form the beginnings of a respiratory tract. The area we are interested in for the development of the nervous system is the neural tube, which is made up of pluripotent stem cells, that as time progress will become more and more specialised cells of the nervous system. At four weeks post-conception, this is what the neural tube looks like from a sagittal perspective. It is C-shaped because essentially we develop in the shape of a prawn before we elongate into a foetus. Here is the rostral end that will go on to develop into the brain and here is the caudal end that will develop into the spinal cord. At four weeks post conception we have three parts of the primitive brain in place. We have the forebrain known as the prosencephalon, the midbrain known as the mesencephalon and we have the hindbrain known as the rhombencephalon. 
we also have the primitive spinal cord and then a canal that runs along the whole length that will go on to form the ventricular system and the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid. Over the next seven days, we have further differentiation of cells as they become more specialised. By five weeks, the neural tube looks more like this. Again, this is a sagittal perspective, but we should also look at this from a coronal perspective. Cells of the previously seen proencephalon and rhombencephalon have further specialised and so we now have five parts instead of three. We have the most rostral part, the telencephalon, which we know is the cerebral hemispheres. We have the diencephalon, which consists of areas like the thalami and the hypothalamus. The mesencephalon, which will go on to form the midbrain. The rhombencephalon then develops into the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. On this image, we can also see the primitive eye from these developing optic vesicles. These draw forward as time progresses to be placed on the anterior of the face. So let's summarise what we have covered so far. At four weeks post-conception, the primary vesicle, most rostral, is the prosencephalon. This, by five weeks, develops into two parts. The telencephalon, our most evolved brain, which in the adult brain is seen as the cerebral hemispheres, and the diencephalon, which will go on to form and the diencephalon, which will go on to form the thalamus and the hypothalamus, etc. One step cordially, at four weeks, we saw the mesencephalon, which will continue to develop into the midbrain. And finally, we had the rhombencephalon, which at five weeks develops into the metencephalon, which are the primitive pons and cerebellum, and the myelencephalon, which will eventually be the medulla. So the adult brain is probably the most instantly recognisable organs due to its wiggles and squiggles seen on the surface. But it's time that we gave these a name. The rounded humps are called the gyrus, for a singular, or gyri for plural. This comes from the Latin word meaning rounded, whilst the sulci are the grooves, coming from Latin meaning furrow. The very outside of the brain is unmyelinated grey matter. In this image, it looks yellowy pink because of the chemicals we use for fixing the brain, but it is greyer in an unfixed brain tissue. Deep to this grey matter is white matter which is constructed from myelinated axons travelling through the CNS. If we look at this coronal section of the brain, it will be easier to see. The white matter is here, which is composed of axons that we collectively call tracks. The grey matter is the area around the outside of the brain that is dark pinky yellow. These are comprised of cell bodies. We also have grey matter within the brain, such as here, which is where we find structures called nuclei, which are essentially a group of similarly functioning neurons that are clustered together. The grey matter is where we see the synapsing of neurons. We are looking at the brain from a superior or dorsal perspective here we can see the left and right hemispheres and the rostral and caudal orientation. You'll notice that we have this big dividing line. This is called the great longitudinal fissure. 
or you might also see it in texts referred to as the sagittal fissure, the cerebral fissure, the longitudinal fissure, the median longitudinal fissure or the interhemispheric fissure. It separates the cerebral hemispheres, but that doesn't mean that each cerebral hemisphere acts completely independently. If we look at these images, we can see that we have this white matter tract running between the hemispheres. When we look at it from a sagittal perspective, we can see this white matter tract here. This is called the corpus callosum, and these tracts are formed by axons that are communicating from one hemisphere to the other. So although the gyri and sulci look like random collection of squiggly mess, they're actually fairly uniform in the healthy adult brain, and mapping out the patterns has helped us to subdivide the telencephalon into different areas called lobes. We have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. To have a better look at the diencephalon, we need to look at this mid-sagittal section of the brain. For the sake of orientation, I'll stick in the corpus callosum here. But it is important to remember that this is part of the telencephalon rather than the diencephalon. The diencephalon begins with the thalamus. The thalamus is like the superhighway crossroads of the brain, where synapses are made and impulses are transmitted to the appropriate part of the cortex. So it has a role in all sensory input, except for smell, all motor input, some emotional or memory circuits, and consciousness. The hypothalamus is largely responsible for homeostasis. So it detects when our blood is too salty and produces hormones that trigger the feeling of thirst. It produces hormones that trigger the pancreas to secrete insulin in response to elevated blood sugar levels. It produces growth factors, sex hormones, thyroid stimulating hormones, adrenal stimulating hormones. Its primary role essentially is to control the hormone release of the body. If we look at this ventral aspect of the brain, we can see the great longitudinal fissure as it continues to the underside. We can also see the continuation of the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe. Caudally, we have the little brain or the cerebellum, and we can see the midbrain, pons and medulla, which collectively form the brainstem. On the brainstem, we can also see a few of the cranial nerves. In this image, we can see the stump that remains of the trigeminal nerve. From the coronal section, we can also see some of the structures. Here is the corpus callosum. We have the white matter nerve axons, some grey matter around the telencephalon, which is made up of the cell bodies, the grey matter around the telencephalon is termed the cerebral cortex. We also have these hollow spaces in the brain that house cerebral spinal fluid. These are the ventricles. This grey matter here is an example of subcortical grey matter and it contains nuclei for multiple different pathways. This is called the basal ganglia. Okay, so we've now looked at the brain, let's go and have a look at the other component of the CNS, the spinal cord. So on the left we can see the spinal cord via a diagram, whilst on the right we can see a cadaveric image of the same area. We have the brainstem at the top, and we can also see some of the dorsal roots of the spinal nerves, the significance of which will become more clear shortly. We can see the spinal cord and we can see how this separates caudally to become the corda equina, which literally translates to horse tail because it resembles a horse tail. In this sagittal view, we can see a transparent skull. For the purposes of orientation, we can see the spinal column. The ventral aspects of the spinal column are the weight-bearing bones called vertebral bodies.
and dorsally we can see the spinous processes. The spinous processes act as muscle attachment sites for the muscles of the back. Between these two regions we have the canal called the spinal canal. This houses the spinal cord and protects it from a 360 degree angle pre prevented damage to this very important and fragile structure. There are 33 bones in total, which allow for 31 spinal cord segments. The spinal cord segments are the nerves that leave the spinal cord through intervertebral foramina and transition into the, peri into the peripheral nervous system, innervating the rest of the body. We have eight cervical spinal segments, called C1 to 8, 12 thoracic spinal segments called T1 to T12. We have five lumbar spinal cord segments, L1 to L5. Five sacral spinal cord segments, S1 to S5. And one coccygeal segment, most caudally. Each segment gives rise to one pair of spinal nerves one travelling to the right-hand side of the body and one travelling to the left. So in total, we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves forming part of the PNS. On this image, we can see the dorsal aspect of the lumbosacral spine, where the corda equina demonstrated. In black, we can see the body of L4. And on the right in blue, we can see the right L4 spinal nerve leaving the spinal canal through the intervertebral foramen. This pattern continues until the coccygeal nerve. So now we've looked at the spinal cord from a dorsal and sagittal perspective we should look at a transverse cross-section. If we take a pair of scissors to the spinal cord and cut it as though we were cutting a rope, we would be able to see this under low power magnification. For the purposes of orientation, we have the dorsal aspect, which would be the area of the spinal cord closest to the skin of the back, and the ventral aspect, which is the surface towards the inside of the body. The spinal column, just like the brain, is composed of grey and white matter. The white matter, just like the brain, are myelinated axons, whereas the grey matter is unmyelinated and largely composed of cell bodies. We have areas within the white and grey matter that we need to label, so let's start with this the dorsal white column. This is where spinal cord sends sensory information that enters the spinal cord into the brain via ascending axons. The lateral white column includes axons of neurons that come from the cortex of the brain to synapse the spinal motor neurons, whilst the ventral white column carries axons that convey pain and temperature information to the brain and separate axons that convey motor functions to the required region of the body. The ventral white commissure is an area of myelinated axons where impulses for neurons detecting pain and temperature are crossed over from the left-hand side of the body to the right cerebral cortex and vice versa within the spinal cord. The other sensory modalities do not cross over until the medulla, but you do not need to worry about this information at this time. The point of this is just to introduce you to what you see on a spinal transverse section. Let's have a look at the grey matter. The first grey matter is this dorsal horn. The dorsal horn receives sensory neurons from the peripheral nervous system. The ventral horn sends motor information back to the peripheral nervous system. The lateral horn is a little different. Lateral horns are only present between T1 and L2 and S2 to S4. 
the lateral horns send motor neurons into the sympathetic chain for sympathetic innervation of the organs of the thorax, abdomen and pelvis. So what we have covered here has been largely the CNS with introduction to the spinal segments which transition into the peripheral nervous system. But let's go and have a look at a little closer at the spinal segments so that the spinal cord transverse image makes a little bit more sense. So we have the central nervous system consisting of the brain and the spinal cord in green and the peripheral nervous system, which is every other nerve coloured in purple. These arrows in blue and pink represent the impulse direction of neurons. Blue represents the afferent fibres, which are sending sensory information to the central nervous system, whilst the pink represent efferent fibres that send motor information from the central nervous system to the body. To help you remember this, think of afferent to affect or influence and efferent meaning the effect or end result. Let's have a look at how this information gets into the spinal cord. Here there are two spinal cord segments. We have zoomed in on the top spinal cord segment and we will focus on the left spinal nerve which is on the right hand side of this image. This is because in anatomy we look at the patient as though they are standing in front of us and facing us. We should label this image. On the front we have a collection of many fibres that are coming from the ventral horn of the spinal cord. These are called the ventral rootlets. On the dorsal aspect we also have the dorsal rootlets. These fibres that are entering the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The ventral rootlets come together and form a ventral root and the dorsal rootlets come together and form a dorsal root. But the dorsal root as you'll notice has this little swelling this is called the dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion houses the cell bodies of sensory neurons. The fibres of the dorsal root ganglion and ventral root then come together into a single branch and form what we know as the spinal nerve, which we saw a short while ago is named after the vertebral number from which it exits the spinal cord and becomes part of the peripheral nervous system. Remember, each spinal segment gives off one pair of spinal nerves, one that travels to the left and one that travels to the right. Let's zoom in and focus on how neurons carry the information. In blue, Travelling from the periphery to the dorsal horn is the afferent or sensory neuron. We can see the cell body is sat within the dorsal root ganglion. In purple we can see the interneuron within the grey matter of the spinal cord. And in pink we can see the efferent or the motor neuron exiting through the ventral horn and travelling within the ventral root and back to the relevant muscle. So let's go back to our fingers in the flame. We have a sensory or afferent neuron sending the impulse through the dorsal root ganglion into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord where it synapses with the interneuron that crosses over to the ventral horn and the synapse is made to an efferent motor neuron which causes our arm muscles to contract and withdraw our fingers away from the flame. Now what you need to know about this is this scenario is an instantaneous response. It happens so quickly that the result would have no conscious processing 
In everyday language, we would call this a reflex action. The small journey from the dorsal sensory interneuron to the ventral motor is termed a reflex arc and it acts to protect us by speeding up the response time to sudden dangerous stimulus like a hot pan or sharp needle. In most situations we have the ability to override this circuit. Imagine that you need to prick your finger for a blood test or imagine that you grabbed hold of a hot glass bowl. In both situations you know you can't flinch because you'll spill the blood you need for the test or you'll shatter the glass bowl. What happens here is what happens more frequently in daily life. Your afferent sensory fibres enter the dorsal root ganglion and synapse with another nerve. In this case, the postsynaptic nerve travels up the dorsal or ventral white column depending on which sensory type is stimulated. These myelinated axons travel up the spinal cord to the appropriate area of the cerebral cortex where the brain decides the appropriate response and sends impulses down the motor fibres through the ventral or lateral white columns where they synapse at the ventral horn and travel to the arm to tell it to hold that glass bowl or tense up and resist the urge to pull away from the finger prick. These two examples are for your information only, to give you a bigger picture of what happens. They are an example of many spinal tracts present within the central nervous system that although are interesting, are not going to be assessed in your module. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. We have covered the common neuroanatomical terminology and the development of the brain. We have also taken a more detailed look at the anatomy of the spinal cord and the pathways associated with a reflex arc.